are you doing? It's been a while. Not really. It was a couple of weeks ago. But this is the second part of the Christian worldview. The Christian worldview has been developed. It's extensive. Um, it's been around for over 2,000 years, for about 2,000 years. These other worldviews are very new. Um, secular humanism really only got going in the 19th century. Same with Marxism. They're very new. So the Christian worldview has been thought over and analysed for far longer. It's far better developed. When there are inconsistencies logically in it, um, those have been pulled out, nutted through and worked out. So the Christian has a lot to offer society. I'm presenting this information because I want to encourage people to talk, to understand each other, because conversation and discussion has really broken down in our culture. And it seems like our culture is splitting up into different groups and they're not talking to each other. And that's a, not a good thing. That's not a good thing for our community. So this isn't about trying to convince you. This is information that I'm trying to give you about the Christian worldview. So if you meet a Christian, you'll be able to have a discussion with them. And if you are a Christian, you can think more deeply about your own worldview. And I recommend we all do that, no matter what our worldview is, because everybody has a worldview. Nobody is neutral. Most people don't or haven't thought about their worldview because it operates just under the surface, usually, of our conscious thinking. So here we go. In English-speaking countries, we have one word for God. God. But you may not realise for the Christian, God represents the role of God in your life. It's not his name. In the Bible, God reveals himself to Moses and Moses says, Lord, who should I say is sending me? In other words, what's your name? Who should I say you are? And God replies, tell them, I am has sent you. Now, that word I am in English is a Hebrew word that has been transliterated as Yahweh. So when Christians talk about God, they're not talking about Allah, which is the um which is the uh, Muslim God, they're not talking about other things that are called God. When Christians are talking about God, they're specifically talking about Yahweh. To say yes to Yahweh for a Christian is to say no to other um, postulations about God and the supernatural realm. It doesn't mean they're closed-minded and they don't want to talk about it. It just means that they've made a decision to put their believing loyalty into that God, Yahweh, in human form, Jesus, who died on the cross and rose from the dead. Whoever would draw near to God, so whoever who wants to come to God, must first believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. The Bible presents the world that we live in as an unseen and a seen that are integrated. Organic-based humans and the flora and the fauna on the earth in the seen world, that adheres, it adheres to the laws of physics and nature that we all know. Well, scientists know. And so the naturalist 
can discover true things about the world. And the Christian, the biblical Christian, can gain a lot from science and scientific discovery. But the Christian is always recognising that the physical is only a subset of the real reality, the bigger reality. And that's really important to understand. And that has flow on effects to the Christian idea of psychology and other things that we'll go into later. When God created the world, what that means is that it's not the product of chaos or random chance or natural processes, but created, he created it in an orderly and deliberate way. And it operates in a discoverable manner, in a purpose, with a purpose and meaning intrinsic to it. It was made with meaning and purpose in mind. The seen world is very complicated, but it is logically ordered and discoverable. But the Bible is clear that shadows of the unseen can be cast in the seen world. So on the one hand, Christians believe and use the scientific method. Christians aren't against science. In fact, science and its methods were developed largely within and complementary to the Christian worldview, not, as some might say, despite it. From your book, The Return of the God Hypothesis, in 1277, this says something about the sweep of your book right there. In 1277, Etienne Tompier, the Bishop of Paris, writing with the support of Pope John XXI, condemned Necessarian theology and 219 separate theses influenced by Greek philosophy about what God could or couldn't do, close quote. Now that's a mouthful and it seems just unbelievably abstruse. What on earth has that got to do with the scientific method? Let's, let's unpack that because it's actually fairly clear. The Greeks always are the great histories of the Western intellectual tradition, and so they should be. They gave us philosophy, Plato and Aristotle, but Greek science was impeded by assumptions that the Greeks made about the nature of nature. They assumed that built into nature was a kind of intrinsic logic that uh, they characterized as the logos, and so they also assumed that the order that they in nature was governed by this logic so that whatever seemed most logical to us was also what was built into nature, was, was logic, it was the logical form of the order in nature. So what's the most logical and perfect form of, of motion? It's a circle. So how do the planets uh, go, you know, what, what are planetary orbits? What kind of shape do they have? It must be circular. And there were numerous uh, logically deduced um, conclusions about nature that were not empirically grounded. What's so his, so the, Greek, the Greeks worked things out in theory and assumed that they worked that way in practice. Exactly, exactly. So they did a lot of armchair philosophizing about nature. It wasn't that they weren't interested in nature or they didn't assume that there was an order there, but they assumed it was an order that had to be a certain way, the way that appeared most logical to them. Okay, and now uh, again from the return of the God hypothesis, because God himself, because God himself possesses a certain free will, a certain freedom, quote, quoting you, the order in nature could have been otherwise. The job of the natural philosopher, the old term for scientists, the job of the natural philosopher was not to ask what God must have done, but what God actually did, close quote. And, that's and that intellectual a, yeah. presupposition is unique to the West. Yes, because, and the idea is that, yes, there's an order in nature, but it's an order that's impressed upon nature or engraved upon nature from the outside because, God, because there was a creator who, who chose the form of order that would be manifest in creation, we have to go and look and see which form it is. There's an order, but which order is up for us to go and to, to discover? And that quote that you just attributed to me is almost a direct paraphrase of Robert Boyle, who said that the job of the natural the philosopher chemist. is not to look at what God must have done, not to, not to decide what God must have done, but to go and look and to see what he actually did do. Remember C.S. Lewis? I've got another quote from him. This is really cool. The naturalists have been engaged in thinking about nature. They have not attended to the fact that they are thinking. The moment one attends to this, it is obvious that one's own thinking cannot be merely a natural event. 
and that therefore something other than nature exists. The Bible relays a creation narrative that has two distinct sections. Scholars have debated about the differences, um, but what's not as not debated is the Bible clearly portrays the universe as having been created by Yahweh. There's a, there is limited information as to how, the me mechanisms of how he did it, because the Bible's main concern is about relationships, your relationship with God, God's relationship with you, his relationship with crea his creation, your interpersonal relationships. A lot of people at the time that Darwin wrote saw Darwin's book as an out. They saw it as a way to finally throw off the, uh, the yoke of Christianity and go in their own direction. The discovery that the universe and all matter is finite, that means that it had a beginning. The discovery of the complex encoded information in DNA are just two data points that work against the conclusions of Darwinian evolution. The secular humanists have taken Darwin's idea of evolution and expanded it quite extensively. So they have two jumps that they, that they need to explain. The first jump is how did something go from nothing to there being something? The Big Bang, you might think about it that way. So excluding God, how could something go from nothing to there being something? That's the first jump. The second jump that neo-Darwinism uh, wants us to believe is how can no life all of a sudden create life? So, okay, fine. Let's, for argument's sake, let's say nothing, then something, and there were rocks and amoebas and maybe water and stuff like that. These, these aren't living things. Well, amoebas are living, so cancel that out. But rocks and water and air and gases, these aren't living things. How did, how did evolution, some sort of process, go from no life to life? The Bible displays or declares that God, Yahweh, is the creator God who created all other things, seen and unseen. And it is from this position that humans can go out and understand the world around them. They are quite unique in the animal kingdom. We have the ability to understand our surroundings and to perform uh, scientific exploration because our brains are such that we're able to understand and the world is created in such a way that it's discoverable. And it's quite adventurous. It's a, an adventure of science. So here's a quote from Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 to verse 20. For by him, him meaning Jesus, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Now those words, when Paul is saying it, he's talking about unseen um, unseen uh, Elohim who have positions of authority as other countries' gods. All these things, all these dominions, all these seen and unseen things, all these things were created through him, Jesus, and for him. And he, Jesus, is before all things. And in him... All things are held together or hold together. And he is the head of the body, which is the Christian church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might have and be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him, 
to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So let me unpack that just a little bit. He's the head of the body. So in the Bible, the church, all the people that believe and have joined themselves to Jesus through believing in him, they are his body on the earth doing good works, doing things to help remind people that God is still real and he still loves you and he still wants you to uh, think about him. And that's what Christians are supposed to be doing. We'll get into that more when we go into sociology. Um, Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. When human beings die, you might think that's natural. The Bible says no. Death is not something that God made. Death is a consequence of being separated from God. If you watch the video we did last time, I talk a bit about that. So we're all born on this earth, separated from God. We have to find God at some point in our lives. We, we need to look for him and he's discoverable and he wants us to find him. Death was not part of the original plan, but because human beings turn away from God, death came. And this death has authority over us. All people die. The Bible says it's appointed once to die and then the judgment, as in like coming before God to see your maker. Um, so when Jesus died on the cross, when he came down and he died, what he did, and I explained this in the other video, so go over there after this, um, but I'll say it a little bit here. What Jesus did when he died on the cross was he broke the authority of death. God, in human form, died, went into the ground, got buried, and broke free of death because he's God. He can't die. He can't um, be held by death. He has all the authority. So what he needed to do, why he needed to die, one of the reasons was to break the power of death over human beings to set them free from death. So anyone who comes to Jesus, their body may die. But Jesus is going to give them eternal life this idea of death is not the end is a massive deal for Christians. You've got to understand for Christians, the Christian biblical worldview, death is not the end. There is an eternal afterlife with God or apart from God. Ethics. Ethics is a massive core of the worldview for Christians, for biblical Christianity, all right? Biblical ethics are based on the character of God. God is good. That's how the Bible shows God. God is good. So good isn't something outside of God that God looks and says, that's awesome. Good isn't some sort of uh, like preference that God has where he's like, well, I like this, so therefore it's good. No, God is the good, okay? So God can't do evil because he's good. The standard of behavior, the standard of not sinning, remember before we talked about sinning being what should be done and what you ended up doing. Um, the standard for Christian morality is perfection. You need to be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect, Jesus said. And you're like, whoa. And many people before you who have read the Bible, especially the Sermon on the Mount, have gone, whoa, this is way outside of my ability. Yes, that's the point. God demands perfection because he's good. 
he recognises that you're not able to do that, that doesn't change the fact that that's the standard. It just means that no one is going to get to God by being good. Here's, if you start fishing around for people's view of Jesus and what they think you believe, um, odds are you're going you're gonna to come up with a story like this. And it's a story that's worth really clarifying what, if this is actually somebody really thinks. And the story is going to go something like this. They may not believe that, but they think that this is what you believe or something like that. So here we all are here on planet Earth. Uh, it's a beautiful and also tragic place. And uh, here, here's uh, me and, and you and so on. And so here we are, uh, we're living our lives, and uh, you know, sometimes great, sometimes really sad. And um, th th your friends think that you believe that uh, you know, you're trying to do pretty good, sometimes you fail, uh, sometimes you do really poorly, you're kind of hoping to get more on this side of the line than that side of the line, but we're all kind of a mixed bag. But at the end of the game, uh, God's gonna you know, close the curtains on history, and based off of uh, how good you've been or how bad you've been, or on whether or not you happen to hold correct ideas and beliefs about who Jesus is, uh, your destiny is one of two places. So one of those places will um, be heaven, and the other uh, place, the bad place, will be, will be hell. And uh, heaven, if you kind of fish this out of people in, in the popular cultural imagination is, you know, these are both like maybe disembodied, non-physical places. This has to do with clouds and harps and singing in the presence of God. And this has to do with like some subterranean torture chamber or something like that, right? Where, where God is sadistically hurting people. Are you, I mean, you guys, you guys with me? This is what people think that followers of Jesus believe. The vast majority of people in the West think that this is what you believe. And some of you in the room might be thinking, yeah, kind of is what I, what I believe. <laughs> and so, um, I'm, I just, uh, I love you and I care about you. <laughs> and and this, is, um, this is wrong. It's wrong. The main problem with this story is the Bible. <laughs> and the other main problem with this story is the actual life and teachings of Jesus. This story is shot through with so many half or one quarter truths that it's just not helpful. We need to think, we need to read our Bibles again with a fresh set of eyes. God is, has a plan of redemption. That means buying them back, redeeming them, making them fit again for his presence. And he's doing that through Jesus. So as far as morality goes in the Bible, there's one law in the Old Testament that Jesus says is the most important. And there's one law in the New Testament. And all Christian morality comes out of these t this law. That you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And that you shall love your neighbour, the person around you, wherever you are, as you love yourself. This is Professor Ed Langerak of St. Olaf, uh, Professor of the uh, Philosophy. He says, Christian morality consists of living one's life with guidance and inspiration from the Christian scriptures and traditions. Christian ethics is an academic discipline that uses these scriptures and traditions in developing and critiquing ethical norms and theories and applying them to ethical issues. Most Christian ethicists agree that the source for doing ethics includes revelation, which is the Bible, and tradition, as well as human reason and experience. So the way that the Christian conducts themselves in the world has some certain guidelines from God. Psalm 34, verse 22. The Lord, Yahweh, redeems the life of his servants. So there's that idea of redeeming. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Proverbs 
12, verse 10. Whoever is righteous, when the Bible says righteous, it means someone who has put their faith in God and wants to do the right thing by God. Whoever is righteous has regard for the life of his animals, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 11 to 15, this is Jesus speaking. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So do you see what Jesus is saying there? Because Jesus created us, he loves us. He's not willing He's not going to run at the first opportunity of danger. He wants to protect us from evil. He doesn't want to push us into evil. God is good. Proverbs 27:19. As in water, face reflects face, so the heart of a man reflects The man. It's in your heart that evil and sin start. It's not out here, although it can be there too. For the Christian, morality is about what's in here. So this is Mark chapter 7, verse 20 to 23. And he said, this is Jesus, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For from within... Out of the heart of a man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting. Coveting means just wanting something, like being greedy. Uh, Wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. And they are what defile a person. The Jews of Jesus' day thought that if you ate the wrong food, that you were a bad person, that you somehow defiled yourself and God didn't love you anymore. But Jesus is saying, no, it's what is in here that defiles someone. And that Jesus always, God always, Yahweh always loves his creation. He will never not love his creation. So in Romans 13, 8 to 10, it says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled all the law. For the commandment, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. All these you shall nots, you shall nots, you shall nots. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the intent of the law. That's not his words. He said love is the fulfillment of the law, meaning all of the Old Testament laws and everything that God gave uh, the Jewish believers to live by. It's all about doing two things, two things. One, preparing for Jesus to come, to recognize him. And to recognize that it's in here that's evil. This is what makes you unclean. How you behave from here. So you might not kill anybody, but you could be have a really hating heart. All right, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father in heaven, sons of your father who is in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust.
For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors and the bad people, that's my word, do the same. And if you greet only your brothers or the members of your family, what more are you doing than other people? Do not even the Gentiles, the people who aren't Jewish, do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Josh Swamidas wrote this about his uh, genetic study of the history of human beings. All right? It's a book called The Geneal Genealogical Adam and Eve. We are all linked together in the recent past by genealogical ancestry. The human race is a single family and a common story, whatever our skin colour, country of origin, ethnicity or culture, we are all one family. We are one blood, one race, the human race. God did not create the world by fighting. So you shouldn't live in the world by fighting. Psychology. Let's talk about psychology from a Christian worldview perspective. The Bible presents a human as having a material aspect integrated with a non-material aspect. Surprise, surprise. It's how God created the world, the seen and the unseen. It's the same with human beings. The soul is housed in a body and a body without a soul is physically dead. But the soul of human beings is born disconnected from the life and the purpose of the creator God, Yahweh. Therefore, it's described as metaphorically dead at the birth of a human being and needs to be born again. The soul resurrection, being born again, is connected to the bodily resurrection of Jesus. So that anyone who joins their life with Jesus by investing their loyal trust and faith in him, from a Christian worldview perspective, is born again and the soul springs to life. So that now you have a old you, and you have a new you cohabiting in the same body. So it's true. You know it. The word sin means to miss or fail God's intent. Do you believe God has an intent for just about everything that there is? He's a deliberate being who designed things on purpose for a purpose. Sin causes us to miss or fail God's intent. Okay? But now it's not just what you do. It's why you do it that becomes important. And I'll relate that through my own experience. But in Hebrew, there are three words that underscore the why I miss the mark, even though I'm an intelligent, rational creature that does have half a will to do the will of God. There are reasons why I still fall short. It's useful to know what those three areas are that will continue to be a problem for you and those that you're going to serve. Agreed? Here it is. I miss the mark or I fall short because I defy God. I resist. It's the opposite of submission and surrender. Agree? What does Oswald Chambers say? All God really wants is your absolute surrender. And so, now, when we think of rebellion, which is getting what you want your way, why is rebellion like the sin of witchcraft? Even though the occult has many variations, tarot card reading to find out the future, or satanic ritual abuse, or just casting a magic spell on someone in the hope of love. There are many different ways one can practice the occult. How is all of that like rebellion? I'll tell you, it's not the practice, it's the purpose that unites them to get what you want independent from God. This is what offends him. 
Why look to tea leaves when I who make the future can tell you? I tell my secrets to my friends. So then why, if God is good and you've heard it said he is, why would we defy him and resist him? What does that tell us? I said it to you earlier. You don't surrender to somebody you don't trust. I will defy you, and I will resist you, and I won't yield, and I will find my own way if I don't think that you care about me, and if I think that your character is not good. Does that make sense? People do things for reasons. Okay. Then, very differently, I miss the mark, I fail God's intent for another altogether different motivation, because I am weak. My fallen nature has corrupted my will. It's kind of like having awakened from a coma. I'm going to be okay, but you know, I've been in coma for a long time, and so my muscles had, have atrophied. They are weak. Now, do you believe God willed that I move my arm? He made my arm for use. It's his intent that I move it and use it with strength and function. Absolutely. And I agree with that intent. I want to move my arm also. But there's a third element here that in spite of what God intends and in spite of what I want to do in agreement with that intent, I have been made weakened. And consequently, I send the signal from my brain and the muscles aren't able to fulfill the will because they have been weakened. This is the concept of this word in Hebrew. In fact, the literal translation says, I would stand up, but my ankles have been so weakened that I falter. So here the idea is I wish to do the will of God. I agree to do the will of God and that it is right to fulfill God's intent. However, there's this extra element thrown into the mix that in spite of what I want to do in agreeing with God, I have been weakened. And so my approach to someone in the weak camp is different from then the defiant camp of lacking trust. This is the wounded and the wary finding their own way on their terms. This is playing it safe. This is someone who wants to do the right thing, but they stumble and they fumble, they falter and they fall because they have never mastered this area yet. Babies learning to walk fall down. Christian parents don't say, you bad, evil baby, don't you know the will of God is that you walk uprightly? Well, yes, of course it's true, but that takes time to be developed with many failures before, through perseverance, that outcome is achieved. Agreed? Now, funny how we don't give that to somebody who's trying to walk out of sin when they've awakened from the coma of sin, and now they're going to make it, but their whole will has been completely weakened. Then, I miss the mark and I fail God's intent because, the Hebrew word says, I have been misled. The actual Hebrew says compromised and corrupted by others. For example, it's not my fault Adam and Eve made a really, really bad choice that destroyed my spiritual heritage, but I'm the one that has to deal with it. And it's not my fault that my mother was chaotic and an alcoholic and that she died, but I'm the one that didn't have a mother. And it's not my fault I got sexually violated by an adult man, but I'm dealing with the aftermath. It's not my fault, but those are very real things that happened to me that marked my life and corrupted me. And so I have been misled, and so have you. Now you add all three of them together, because we demonstrate all three of them continually. Who doesn't have a few issues? Thank God God understands. And thank God the blood of Jesus knows how to deal with all of this. And we can deal with it better if we understand human dynamics and why we wrestle with the things that we do. And when we understand how God fixes it. When you put your faith in Jesus, the Bible says that something comes alive in you that is connected to God. Something that wasn't alive before. So that you're fundamentally different now. But the struggle comes because the old self is still there. Still warring against the good that's come. And that's what Christians have to struggle with, putting to death the sin nature, it's called in theology. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Sociology. 
for a Christian, how people come together. What's the unit of society? If you go and you read Genesis chapter 1, God created a family, a man and a woman. And they had children. But if you look at the imagery, God had children, Adam and Eve, and they sinned and left the family or turned away from the family. So really, for all of society in the Bible, from the biblical worldview perspective, the unit of society is the family. And that's really, really important. The man was created in a direct relationship to Yahweh and the woman was created out of his side. People see the Bible as teaching a male dominance, but the actual teaching of the Bible is correcting what wrong cultural perceptions, correcting that wrong cultural perception that there is a hierarchical or a qualitative difference between men and women. The Bible says that they're made of the same stuff. So here's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 8 to 12. Man was not made for woman, but woman was made for man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Nevertheless, in the Lord, in Yahweh, Woman was not independent of man, nor was man independent from woman. For as a woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Do you see what he's trying to do? In the Roman culture in which he's writing, it was very patriarchal, very patriarchal. And he's saying, no, it wasn't like this at the beginning. Man and woman were designed to be intricately connected so that you can't get one without the other. Two humans in union with each other as one. So to understand what a human being is, you can't understand that by separating men and women. You can under, only understand what a human being is from a biblical worldview by bringing a man and a woman together. Christ rejects as false the idea that man and woman are somehow different or independent. They were created together for the, from the same substance to complement each other. In Ephesus, or sorry, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28, there runs through, it's probably a bit too long to read, but there runs through a sequence. So Paul says, In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man, this is a quote from Genesis that Paul is making in Ephesians. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery, this is Paul talking again in his letter. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So Paul is saying this idea, this line in the Old Testament is referring to, or he's, ref he's saying it refers to Christ and the church, that Jesus and those that believe in him become one spiritually. In the same way that a man and a woman, be when they get married and have start a family, they become one physically. So let no, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that he respects her husband. Because 
in the cultural uh, environment of his day, Paul was living in a Roman world, patriarchal. Um, women would congregate to, to talk about their issues and their husbands. There wasn't necessarily a love relationship between married couples is what I'm trying to say. But then Paul goes on to say about children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So you can see how this unit of man and woman coming together brings forth children and then the father is in the position like God, the father, like Yahweh, that he can't behave in a way that is aggressive and horrible towards his children. Why? Because Yahweh is good. Because Yahweh treats his children. There's discipline, yes, but it's all encased in love. It's in the interaction with other people that is part of the development of character. So the, t the degree that you only isolate yourself with those that you love or your family or your friends and you don't engage with other people, that has a net bad effect for society. So in the Christian worldview, it's really important that people are able to go out and talk to each other. For politics. Considering that Jesus's whole ministry was predicated on declaring that the kingdom from God has come, it's not a... It's not an overestimate to say that the Christian worldview has politics running all the way through it. Politics is essentially how people are governed. And um, by what theories, by what values, by what worldview. And God has been governing his creation with a council of Elohim. And in the same way, we have developed human government. So the Bible doesn't give specific instructions on what system of government should be prescribed for a nation. Rather, the Bible presents principles and foundations for how to build a government from the bottom up or give Christians those that have put their faith in Jesus and are following what, listening to and following what he says, gives Christians guidance on how to respond to tyrannical top-down government. How should Christians influence government? Well, before we talk about that, I think we have to clear out of the way some wrong views. And there are, I think, five wrong positions on this. One is uh, what I call compel religion. That is, the government should compel people to uh, go to certain churches or support certain belief systems. That, that is wrong because it violates the fact that genuine religious faith has to be voluntary, can't be compelled by force. And number two is the opposite view, and that is exclude religion from the public square, exclude religion from any influence on government. And uh, that's the view that's promoted by certain secularist groups, uh, both in the United States and the UK. I think that's contrary to the biblical teachings about uh, Daniel influencing Nebuchadnezzar, John the Baptist influencing Herod, Paul influencing uh, the Roman governor, and the fact that the Bible teaches about the moral standards and the responsibilities of government. So I think we should bring Christian influence to bear. Compel religion is wrong, exclude religion is wrong. There's another view, kind of a minority view, that says, um, Government is evil, and it's the area of uh, Satan's control and influence, and Christians shouldn't be involved in it, shouldn't serve in government, uh, uh, or at least if they do, it's not advancing the kingdom of God. But um, that view is incorrect because Romans 13 says the civil authority is God's servant for your good, not Satan's servant, God's servant. 
So uh, those who work uh, in, the, in the civil government, those who work as, uh, in, the, in the military or police force, I think that Romans 13 says you should view your task as something that is God-given and you're serving God in that. Um, and I think that goes for Christians influencing politics or serving uh, as members of parliament or something like that as well. They're God's servants. Uh, the fourth view is do evangelism, not politics. And that is, uh, the church shouldn't get involved in any political issues, but, but my question to them is, well, wh what parts of the Bible are you deciding not to preach on? Are you going to preach on Romans 13 that talks about the role of government? What about 1 Peter 2? Um, shouldn't we preach the whole counsel of God, even uh, about government? So, um, uh, and the last, let's see, so compel religion is wrong, exclude religion is wrong, government is uh, evil and satanic is wrong, um, uh, do evangelism not politics is wrong and the, the last view isn't very common among evangelicals but it has been historically common and that is uh, do politics not evangelism that is uh, just transform society and that'll bring heaven on earth or you know, that, that's all that God calls us to do and uh, more liberal Protestant churches at least in the United States in the early part of the 20th century were involved in this social gospel we just need to uh, uh, transform society through our actions, uh, but they forgot personal evangelism. Well, that's wrong. So uh, those are five wrong views. The right view, I think, is uh, the sixth one, and that is significant Christian influence on government. The Bible presents civil government as necessary and instituted by God. Necessary because at the end times, when all of this world has been finished and Jesus has come back, that the Christians will be ruling and reigning with Jesus on the earth as it was intended in the first place. So government is, or politics in government, is um, not just a product of this world. It's a product of the unseen world as well and in, into eternity, into the future. It's instituted by God because of the mandate to Adam and Eve to subdue and to rule the earth in the model of the Garden of Eden that God presented to them. So God planted a garden and he said, go make the rest of the earth look like Eden. They sinned and obviously that plan was uh, delayed. Um, but the issue is that God was telling them to rule and reign, to practice ruling and reigning because the idea was that he, he was going to rule with them on this earth. The Bible describes the role of government as being God's agent for the judgment of evil and wrongdoing to uphold judicial justice by enforcing good, well-reasoned general laws and principles favouring no one specifically but administering a type of grace and justice to all who live under the government. The biblical worldview places human government as a service to what is more primary, and that is the family. A political position in Australia is called a ministry. It's a commissioning to serve the people. That's what it's supposed to be. Um, but anyway, I digress. When human government operates within its boundaries, the Christian is to submit and be a good citizen. When, however, the government moves out of its place, demanding that the Christian view human government as primary, usurping the role of God in the Christian's life, Yahweh, the Christian is to reject that authority. There was a transition from the time in which God was working only with one nation to a time in which the gospel went to all nations of the earth. And so Jesus was saying that there is an area that Caesar should not control, and that is the area that belongs to God. And also, by implication, there is an area that Caesar controls, and the government of the church should not seek to govern or control the civil government either. The Bible leaves room for your conscience. And so it doesn't tell you to rebel because you shouldn't. You shouldn't rebel. Rebelling is where evil came from in the garden. 
making sure that you don't do anything to disobey God. And if that means your death, historically has borne this out, that's what Christians did. They willingly went to death so that they didn't disobey God. The idea is not to fear government, but for the Christian to stand up to government and to call the government to good government. Good government, not only for themselves, but for all the people, everybody. Good government serves people. Bad government usurps authority and enforces its will on people. So Mark chapter 10, verse 42 to 45, this is Jesus speaking. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, that's people who aren't Jews, lord it over them and their great ones, their generals, exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be a slave to all. For even so, the Son of Man, that's Jesus' favorite phrase to refer to himself and his mission. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus there is teaching his disciples. It's not about power. It's about service. In the Bible, in the biblical worldview, there is not a one-to-one -one correlation between Christian morality and the laws that if Christians were in government that they should pass. It's not a one-to-one -one it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. This means that the precepts by which Christians are taught to live in the Bible do not and should not automatically translate into what should be enforced on everyone by law. Uh, biblical lawmaking in human government is derived from two main sources. The promotion of the good as defined by Yahweh in the Bible, Yahweh's character, the promotion of good and the natural seen world. So this is what's called natural law. It's a law that is reasoned. Therefore, any law to be proposed by a government in the Christian worldview is to be reasoned and debated so that the best possible law can be promoted. Bad or ill-reasoned laws create confusion and create injustice. The purpose of law in a biblical worldview is to establish, maintain and preserve justice at a policy level, protecting the human person, their family and their property from plunder, that would be criminal law, to ensure the fidelity, that means the truthfulness or the honesty towards contracts and, family, and fairly judge disputes and lawsuits. While the well-being socially of the people is a shared responsibility. Do you get what I mean by that? So government in a biblical worldview do not have to deal with poor people necessarily because in the biblical worldview, the responsibility to look after poor people in your community is on the Christian. It's not on the government. The people in charge of law stay in a certain box and they don't go out of that box because they're going outside of their authority. The Bible is really clear. Law itself cannot produce or cause anyone to be righteous. Law and the enforcement of law does not change a human heart. So in the biblical Christian worldview, it's far more important for individual people to interact and engage with individual people. 
the love your neighbour. Law can only point to human frailty and identify unrighteousness or problem behaviour. And injustice, law can only point to the injustice and direct human judges how to proceed. Laws cannot and will never fix any social problem or change any heart of a human. In fact, increasing laws upon laws upon laws and upon laws has the opposite effect. It increases confusion. It increases human suffering. It conceals human corruption, posing as a false righteousness, a legalism. Therefore, laws should be reasoned based on logic and natural principles, appropriate in scope, and described in specific enough language to resist interpretation outside of its intent and to be used to fa- or to be used to favor one person or a group over another. There needs to be careful consideration what Christians should pass into human law. When Christians occupy political office, they should still live according to the high standards that the biblical worldview promotes for them. But the idea that every idea from Christianity needs to be in the represented in the form of law, one of the temptations is to create a Christian, a governmental tyranny, a religious tyranny. But that what Christians do, that has nothing to do with the biblical worldview. In fact, it is talked against in the Bible. When Christians occupy political office, they should be living according to the high standards, but legislate only those laws that protect and serve the community, being able to stay away from becoming a religious, a righteousness tyranny. Economics is kind of like politics. There is no clear system of economics that is outlined in the Bible save to emphasize and develop upon the ideas of personal stewardship. What the Bible is concerned about is that it is, whatever economic system you choose, that it is fair, that it is voluntary and honest. It should be predicated on freedom to provide for your family and the ability to serve your fellow man. The population at large has the responsibility to look after the community and the poor people through an old fashioned word called sharing. And another old fashioned word that you might not have heard before, or maybe you have heard, but you haven't heard it used in a long time, philanthropy. Charity is interested in mitigating circumstances, in bits of the truth that can cast a less catastrophic light on our follies. In financial matters, charity tends always to flow in one direction. The philanthropist may be very generous, but usually they stay rich. They are habitually the giver rather than the recipient. But in life as a whole, and especially in relationships, charity is unlikely ever to end up being one-sided. Who is weak and who is powerful changes rapidly and frequently. You're likely to be, as it were, a patron in one area and a beggar in another. So we must be kind not only because we are touched by the suffering of others, but because we properly understand that we too will soon be in urgent need of an equally vital dose of charity in some other part of our lives. Philanthropy was killed. Christian philanthropy was killed in the UK by the secular humanists who destroyed their funding, you know, all the other stuff, you know, to to make it so that they were the ones that were in control of helping people. So this is 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his own household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Proverbs 20, verse 10. Unequal weights and unequal measures are both alike. They're an abomination to the Lord. So in markets in the olden days, you would weigh out gold or silver or copper or whatever it was and weigh out the goods or wheat or grain that you were doing, that you were buying. And some people used to have dodgy weights. 
So you see that it's not buying and selling. It's not selling for profit either that God doesn't like. Selling for profit is fine. It's that the contract that's entered into by the buyer and the seller is voluntary and it's fair. Because people need to be able to look after their family. It's very important in the biblical worldview that the parents of children take responsibility for their family. And that Christians especially take responsibility to looking after not only their immediate family, but also to a degree their extended family. The biblical economy consists of personal responsibility and stewardship of property, skills and time. The Bible presents a law of sowing and reaping, meaning personal work and personal reward. It also includes the concept of investing and does not in any way preclude the idea of wealth accumulation. The biblical worldview is okay with you being or you know, accumulating wealth. Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to enter heaven. He didn't say that riches were the problem. So what's going on? The point is that wealth and a lack of need for the body can and often does lead to the neglect and the abuse of one's soul. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 17, it says this, Look carefully then how you walk. That's the way the Bible says of how you're living. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What's the will of the Lord? Is it for you to get rich? No. The will of the Lord is for you to Stay faithful and to do good to others, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and to love your neighbour as yourself. They're the only two rules. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. The Bible is definitely not against being wealthy. The Bible is definitely for being wise. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. Now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need. This is Paul talking, right? No need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. Aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, or in other words, mind your own business, and to walk, to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent upon nobody. In the biblical worldview, to be dependent on the government for your the way that you operate your life, it's not part of it. But unfortunately, sometimes governments make it so that life is such that you find yourself dependent. In a biblical worldview, the idea is to work with your hands, to do your work. So if you're a coder for software, work diligently, work hard. And use the money that you get to look after your family and to plan for the future. That's the whole big, there's lots of economic stuff, personal finances, wisdom literature in the Bible about how to deal with work. From a Christian worldview perspective, socialism, the idea that the people as a corporate whole are dependent upon the government is... It is not part of the Christian worldview at all, okay? So anyone that says to you that the Christians, Jesus was a socialist, it, no, no, they do not understand the, Bible, the biblical worldview. 
It's not about brash and extreme individualism either, okay? That is not part of the biblical worldview. The biblical worldview is taking responsibility for yourself, looking out for your family, making sure your family is looked after, and going out and doing good. Whether you're working, do good work. So if you're a Christian coder for software, do good work. If you're a, a goal umpire and <laughs> you're a Christian, I don't know why I chose that one. Do good work. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, it's, Paul says this, Each one must give as he is directed in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The idea of enforced charity via taxation is not part of the Christian worldview at all. It's a voluntary system. So it doesn't have to be the free market system, the capitalism, it doesn't have to be that. But I don't know what other system you're going to get where it's voluntary, that it's fair, that there's not these unstable weights and measures of floating currencies and all this other stuff. That's not, you know, money should be solid, shouldn't depreciate, it's a form of theft. We talked about a lot of history in the last video for Christian Worldview. In this one, I want to talk about the crux of all of history for the Bible. So to do that, I'm going to start off with a quote. And this is from the 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 and following. Now, if Christ, Jesus, is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there's no resurrection from the dead? He's dealing with an issue that's emerging in this Corinthian church. Some people saying, I don't believe in resurrection from the dead. But, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. You see his logic? And if Christ, if Jesus has not been raised, then our preaching, what we've been saying, that Jesus died on the cross was buried and rose again on the third day, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. In other words, if, this, if what you're saying is true and there's no resurrection from the dead, we're telling everybody lies. Because we testify ab about God that he raised Jesus from the dead, whom he did not raise if it's true that no one is raised from the dead. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep, as in died, in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, he's talking about Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. That's Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ is the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And I would say, Jesus died by crucifixion. His disciples had experiences that they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus. 
Because of their belief that he was raised, it is the event that has turned the world upside down religiously. In fact, a recent book on non-believing Jews and the resurrection, they even acknowledge, not being Christians, that Christianity is a resurrection religion. It was the resurrection that powered the religion, uh, to powered the teachings, even to the point of being willing to die. Uh, and we do have first century sources for the, the arguably the three largest names in Christianity. Uh, four, very important, it was proclaimed very early. And today, critics, the, the consensus position is that you can track the resurrection preaching back to immediately after the cross. In fact, the way it's often stated by, say, Bart Ehrman, is that when Paul said yes to Jesus on the way to, to Damascus, there was already a body of data called the early creeds that are later written in the New Testament, but they were already being noised abroad. When Paul said yes, there were these heavy creeds, about 80% of which are in the deity, death, resurrection of Jesus, because that's a major message. They were already in existence. So when Paul, Paul didn't invent Christianity, the main reason, when he came to Christ, the message he hated most, we already have data from that, that two-year period before Paul. And then the last two would be individuals, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul, both of whom become Christians because they believed they had experiences which were appearances of the risen Jesus. Those are the six I would use. And to my knowledge, I've had dialogues with atheists, agnostics, scholars, specialists, and they don't dispute any of those. So how do they respond to this? That you have these facts and you establish them historically, and you say the best explanation of these facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead, right? And there are these existing naturalistic attempts of explaining away these, these facts. Yeah. What is the best one to your knowledge, and then why do you think that it fails? Someone just asked me that yesterday, and I, I made the point, I don't, you'd expect me to say this, but years ago, I would have told you the one that I thought was the hardest answer. Today, I would say, not only are there no good ones, there, there are no good theories that you can really take and ride to the bank, so to speak, if you're a naturalist, you can really take, take care of the resurrection with this, but the critics have generally given up coming, uh, espousing these theories. I did an article uh, some years ago where I argued that less than 25% of the critics in the last 25 years, about less than 25% use the naturalistic theories anymore. They, they will usually say something like this. Um, yeah, facts are good. I don't agree. It's your, your idea is the only way to go. But, you know, you've got an evidence case. And, and if you pushed them a little bit and said, well, what keeps you from believing this stuff yourself? Can yeah, I guess? So good. Go ahead. Hume. Well, Hume, but I think generally they'll say, I just don't want to, I just don't want to believe. Really? And, and they will say miracles don't happen. And that, that say that they know you're ready. They don't often want to take you on. Um, another comment, a comment is, yeah, but you got a problem with your theory. What's that? Well, you've got some data for your theory, and I'm not exactly sure where I would go to refute it, but you're asking me, implicit in your argument, is you're asking me to believe in Middle Earth, Narnia, or if you want a secular example, Oz. You're asking me to believe in that, and there's no world like that. How do you know? Well, there's no, you know, look, everything we know from empirical science, there's not an ultimate universe. And when I'm talking to a person like that, I always go, time out. Let's talk about near-death experiences. And because the evidence has been coming in so well, in a recent book, up to 30 million people in North America, England, and Europe have claimed to have near-death experiences. So I could say, hey, some, let's just say the number's blown up too much and there's only 20 million. In a way, that's 20 million people who've been to Narnia, if you want to look at it that way. So don't tell me there's no empirical evidence for this. And they'll say, yeah, those are just experiences. You don't have data. Well, you don't say that to me. I, I, you know, I just gave, gave a paper yesterday. I, I know of 300 evidenced NDE accounts where what's reported is empirically verified. So if you can't refute it, and it's almost impossible to refute the, the NDEs, if you can't refute them and you have this alternate reality in what category? In the category of afterlife. Oh, so there may be an afterlife. Well, I didn't think so until today, but yeah, I guess maybe there is. Okay, now can we talk about resurrection? See, because I've opened the door to talk about this alternate reality, which may last forever, and you can't say anymore, yeah, but you're asking me to believe in Oz, because I would 
I would say, I sure am, and I've got data for us. It's whether or not Jesus was raised from the dead that everybody should be talking about. Because if Jesus was raised from the dead, then the naturalists have a problem. If Jesus was raised from the dead and all authority has been given to him, then the Marxists have a problem. If Jesus was raised from the dead to um, defeat the principalities and powers, every other religion has a problem. We need to be talking about this.